Hello SRFC. So you may remember back in the dim and distant pre-lockdown past that we were hoping to get Gareth L. Powell along to our March meeting. Uh, so someone that we've been desperate to get along for a while, but unfortunately events transpired and he wasn't able to make it uh, to join us back in March. But uh, I have some notes and, and Gareth has very kindly agreed to do a little bit of an SRFC style uh, reading and an interview. So Gareth is a, a really interesting writer. He's won the BSFA Best Novel twice, uh, firstly for his book Ak Ak Macaque and more recently for Embers of War, the first in a really interesting space opera trilogy. And uh, he is hopefully going to read for us from the beginning of the latest book in that trilogy, Light of Impossible Stars. Hello. Yeah. All right. Okay, I'm going to read um, from the, uh, there's two prologues, so I'm going to read from the first prologue. Um, this is narrated by the Trouble Dog, who is a sentient warship and she is in virtual reality with one of her sibling warships um, who's called Edelwolf. So, I asked, what's the object of this game? The Edelwolf smiled. To win. We were sitting in a virtual environment, a recreation of the Palace of Versailles. Beyond the high windows, ornate gardens stretched away. Fountains sparkled in the clean white sunlight. Edelwolf had dressed his avatar in a dark silk robe. His bony wrists protruded from its sleeves. I had contented myself with my default option, a shaggy-haired, androgynous looking woman in a battered trench coat. A marble chessboard sat on the table between us. And how do you do that? You capture your opponent's king. That's this tall one. Yes. That's it. In essence, yes. And what about these horsey ones? The Edelwolf gave a tight smile. The knights. Yes, I like those. I leaned over the board and tapped one of the pieces in my first rank. And these are the prawns. Pawns. And these cock-shaped ones. Bishops. Got it. Are you ready to play? I think so, I said. Who goes first? I do. Edelwolf reached out a thin arm and plucked a knight from the back row. He moved it over the pawns and placed it on its destined square. I frowned in puzzlement. Edelwolf sighed. What's the matter? That's it? That's your move? It's a classic opening gambit. It doesn't seem to have achieved much. I suppose you can do better? Of course. I leant back in my chair and cracked my knuckles over my head. I braced my feet against the tiled floor and grinned. Watch this. I sprang forward. The fingers of my right hand jabbed Edelwolf in the throat. He started to fall backwards and I flipped the table with my left. By the time the last marble piece rattled down onto the floor, I was kneeling on his chest with his king held triumphantly in my hand. I win, I said. Edelwolf coughed, massaging his battered larynx. You really don't understand chess, do you? I sniffed and clambered to my feet. On the contrary. I let the marble king fall from my fingers. It bounced off his ribs with a hollow thump and rolled away across the floor. You just don't understand tactics. Nah. Thank you so much. And... I, I, I love that prologue because it, it shows a lot of the wit and the humour that come through in these books. But it's, it's kind of really interesting going back to my notes from, from March, which feels like a different, completely different world and, and, and thinking about uh, Light of Impossible Stars, because it's a novel that starts uh, the, the final book in the trilogy, but in a, in a, in a time and space, no spoilers. Uh, where humanity is very divided and fragmented, friends and family are split up and very isolated. There's a huge amount of fear, uh, a lot of anxiety 
uh, there are shortages of food and key equipment and a real sense of it feeling like the world has irrevocably changed and, and we don't know what's coming. So in many ways, it feels feels quite prescient for the kind of times that we find ourselves living in now. Yes, I, I'm kind of kicking myself. I should have written a really happy book and then hopefully that would have come true instead. It's, it's, it's kind of quite, quite strange kind of coming back to it in that light. But it's... Um, it, it, it's also quite a, a hopeful book and, and the setting uh, so trouble dog your uh, sentient warship has um she was she was built for violence but but has a, a lot of had a lot of second thoughts after a war um and, and after having been complicit in committing genocide and has kind of given that up and uh effectively join what I like to think of as space RNLI and kind of turned her life to going and helping stricken spacefarers and, and rescuing people. Yes, it's um, because her um, sort of neural architecture is based on some cloned human cells and some um, canine cells as well. Uh, one of the side effects is that eventually um, emotions start to leak through and there are unexpected consequences because you wouldn't purposefully design a warship with a conscience it's um but it just arises out of her following some fairly traumatic events she starts to think more for herself and starts to realize things and um her, her brother goes through the same journey but he goes into in from a slightly different point of view in that he becomes slightly more selfish and slightly more arrogant, whereas she becomes slightly more um, uncertain and guilty. Um, so yeah, it's very interesting because they're basically like teenagers in the bodies of these huge machines of destruction and getting to go through that universal journey that we all go through of like, who am I? What am I doing here? How come everybody else seems to know what they're doing and I don't? But doing that as a warship with the knowledge that you committed some horrible crimes in your past, it's kind of, it's a tale of redemption, but also of growing up. There, there is a lot in this book about rehabilitation and a lot about making amends. Uh, so by the time we get to the third book, uh, Trouble Dog and her crew are dealing a lot with the consequences of, of some actions that they took in the first book that were taken to uh, preserve the life and safety of, of themselves and other people and taken with very good intentions but have had very unpredictable effects and there's a real sense in the books that everybody deserves a second chance even Ona Sudak who's the who's held up as the as the big villain of the piece of someone who was responsible for some really horrible things in the past um, uh, but is given chance and sometimes chance after chance to to put some of that right um, in those books there's a lovely line I, I just one of my favorites in light where where Nod who by the way is one of my absolute favorite characters says that everything is fixable given time luck and hard work yeah Nod is I think he's the sort of philosophical center of the book in that he's he's very stoic he's he's an engineer his species is just built to um, maintain complex systems that's how they evolved maintaining the complex system of the tree they lived on and so he has a very stoic very kind of unromantic view of the world in some ways in that he you know his perfect day is to work hard and then sleep and it's but that allows him to have a, a kind of an outsider look at the human condition in that you know machines can be fixed and people can be fixed and nothing's ever lost forever but it is, it's a real redemption story this book you know, there's, there's a lot of people trying to fix stuff and make amends and it feels like every single character has some kind of darkness in their past that they are trying to to move on from and that, that ends up reflected in their actions and I think particularly in uh, for, for Sal and for Alva as, as part of the crew of the Trouble Dog. Yeah I think I mean everybody's got something in their past um, and I, 
I'm trying to remember, uh, there's a quote, I can't remember it exactly. I think it's from Hemingway of the world breaks everybody in the end. It's just how you fix yourself that defines who you are. And I think that's, um, that's kind of what I was, I was going for in this book, in that every character has something that's happened in their past uh, um, that has shaped the way they may respond to the present and shape the way they think about themselves and whether they're trying to like own a um, who's committed atrocities in the past but all the time she thinks that she's doing the right thing and she thinks that she doesn't have a choice that she has to do these things it's her duty this is what she needs to do this is what needs to be done so you know she as far as she's concerned she's keeping her integrity because that's all she has to hold on to um whereas the other characters um have done things that they realize were wrong or they've lost people and been completely bereft at the loss and all that informs how they're kind of working together and how they pull together as a sort of found family almost um to look after each other because they're kind of their missing pieces seem to fit together like a jigsaw and found family feels very much a theme of these books, whether it's the the kind of the, the groups like the House of Reclamation where people are coming together, but particularly within the crew. And it's got that kind of real Becky Chambers type feel of of, of, of people rubbing along together and finding ways to coexist. Um, and, and that's sometimes not always being easy, but, but there's a kind of real radical compassion in these books about about people as as fragile broken things and, and and how we how we work and live together and come to some not always easy but compromises and, and ways of being and and that 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 exactly that kind of found family dynamic yeah it's it's they you know for instance sal and alva um they have a deep bond but they're you know but they're, they're still disagreeing they're arguing you know there's there's, there's a, a tension between them the whole time but at the end of the day you know that either one would take a bullet for the other so it's that kind of that kind of family relationship that you know we bicker we argue but at the end of the day we've got each other's backs uh, and it's it's just it's 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 a it's a really lovely book and, and a really brilliant trilogy that uh, is is kind of remarkably easy to read as well. I mean, the the, the pages and the story just rattles along um, at, at a great pace. Uh, and I know certainly one friend of mine who'd been really struggling to read during coronavirus and during lockdown, and, and had been struggling to pick up books for a long while just because of a, a sense of anxiety around the world, uh, picked up embers and was like, "Yes, this is exactly what I need right now. This is this. It's it's got all of those magic ingredients of being a pacey story and a really comforting read and proper bits of escapism. And it was just it it broke through broke through for them a bunch of blocks around reading that they kind of hadn't known that they'd had for a while. Oh, that's really good. I I tried to keep it, although there's quite a lot of sort of fairly deep philosophical questions." um posited in it i tried to keep it very pacey with short chapters and plenty of cliffhangers and revelations and just to keep it moving and a wide variety of character voices as well yes that was um that was a challenge because i've read books before that have a variety of first person um narrators and you forget who's speaking so i had i had to really try hard to kind of alter the way each character spoke to kind of make it obvious who who was um doing it. it's kind of like acting really I was, I was playing five parts in that i was writing these five people as you know as if i was monologuing and yeah that was a lot of fun and that really helped me because you got to see inside each character's head and how they were feeling about the other and it lent that kind of extra poignancy I guess to when one character looks at another and thinks they hate them but you secretly know they really like them and, and stuff like that so um that was good I mean I did kind of set out this out to write this as kind of an anti-space opera in that it's not filled with sort of muscular space marines and um you, you know Captain Kirk types and there's there's no war heroes, there's just all people who've been battered by the war. And 
instead of building up over the trilogy towards this giant, you know, intergalactic battle, it's it follows a giant intergalactic battle. It takes place three years later. And it's how the fallout from that um, affects everybody. So instead of everything falling apart during the books, it's in a sense, there's things are being put back together all the way through the book. Um, and even though, no spoilers, but in the third book, there is a, a, a big reckoning between various forces. It's, I think, a more hopeful reckoning in, in the way it's resolved than just simply a massive shootout. Yeah, and it's so it's so rare that we see those kind of costs and consequences in fiction. You know, people build up to the big the big crisis kind of without without telling us about the aftermath and the damage that is caused. And, and I remember at SRFC uh, a couple of years ago, we had Adrian Tchaikovsky came and and talked about Redemption's Blade, which was which is still the post Dark Lord recovery novel that I am. Um, I had been searching for for all my life of you know what do you do with the problem of the orcs what do you do with the aftermath of these big climactic uh, conflicts that create uh, spoiled landscapes refugees famine uh, broken people trauma and, and how a society will pick itself back up and piece itself together and dust itself off and move on so it's, it's a really kind of hopeful thing to be able to show that we that we can not just have these big conflicts but that we can also pick ourselves up and and, and carry on with our lives not not unscarred by it but 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 there, there is hope and there is a future afterwards one of the things i guess that inspired me was in the at the end of Return of the Jedi, um, there's a scene where they're all celebrating and the, there's an Ewok playing Stormtrooper helmets, like drums. And I was kind of thinking, basically the Ewoks at all the Stormtroopers, because um, they were going to eat Luke and Han and, and Leia to start with. But basically they killed all the Stormtroopers and then they at them. And the rebels are hanging out and they're fine with this. Um, and I kind of thought, like, in a couple of years, there might be a rebel soldier going, I was on Endor, man, the things I've seen. <laughs> yeah. You know, he's too scared to look at a teddy bear because he's just seen these, like, little fairy things just pulling people apart and eating them. And Ewoks. he was so terrified. Ewoks are terrifying. Yeah. But he was complicit with that. So he, how would he feel in five years' time about that? And that it's kind of a silly thing but it kind of it kind of helped me towards the mindset of this novel is how would you feel after doing something like that um, and being complicit in something that was looked at objectively quite horrific um, and, and and light's not the only book that you've had out recently you've also had uh, a novella uh, called, called ragged alice which is a completely different kind of a book do you want to tell us a little bit about that one Yes, um, Ragged Alice is a very personal book in some ways, but it's, I, I sat down to try and write a kind of Lee Child style thriller that would be on sale in airports and become a movie franchise and I could retire to Hollywood. But it didn't work out like that. What came out was a kind of dark, kind of slow, murder mystery set in a, a little town, Welsh town, next to Aberystwyth um, about this detective with this strange ability to kind of see a person's soul and to see whether it's tarnished by guilt um, and the fact that she can't really handle having that talent, she can't because it makes her unable to trust a lot of people. So she's investigating this this what is initially a hit and run uh, but then turns into a string of murders um and murders that are unexpectedly personal for her so it was kind of like a welsh twin peaks i guess um because there's um kind of the countryside of wales is absolutely beautiful absolutely beautiful but at night it can be very eerie when you have the, the sort of the 
the ridges with the, the pine trees in, in ranks and the, the rolling hills and the deep dark valleys and, and, and rustling bracken and gorse and so on. It can be quite an eerie place. It's very quiet. And so I kind of wanted to kind of express that duality um, of what Wales is to me. It's this, this beautiful, beautiful place. Um, it's the place where my father came from. And, but at the same time, it's a little bit eerie. There's, and there's a sense that you're treading on history wherever you walk. Um, so there are, there are standing stones, there are mysterious streams. And there's this whole Celtic kind of mythological stuff going on in the background. And then at the same time, there's an abandoned air base and suggestions that there were um, dodgy scientific experiments going on there in, in the 60s, 50s and 60s and so on. And it's so it's, you could look at it as a as sort of a sci-fi book or you could look at it as a horror book or you could look at it as a, you know, a, a, a pretty straightforward um, murder mystery. So it's kind of occupies that sort of liminal space between the three. Um, and I never definitely say which one it is. So. And it's, it's interesting because your main character is someone who's gone away from that kind of quiet rural Welsh village but has come back and feels still very uncomfortable and very out of place in that environment. Yes, I mean she, she ran away when she was 18 to London and joined the police now she's come back years later and does feel weird coming home and she has all this stuff in her past that she hoped she would never have to face up to but then something's gone badly wrong in London for her so she's having to come back to uh, because the Met just want to get rid of her so she's come back uh, to the Dubbin Powers Police Force and she's trying to get over that she's trying to get over the, the weirdness around her her peculiar ability and how she got that peculiar ability in the first place so it's um yeah she's a very complicated character I really enjoyed writing her um she does bear a little semblance to to sell in the embers trilogy i think they would they would recognize bits of each other if they ever met but at the same time she's she's quite dogged and she won't let anything get her down she's like um if, if something's you know if, if something's trying to kill her she'll look it in the eye she won't run away and, and be afraid and have you got the monkey off your back yet? Oh, I do hope so. Um, yeah, it's been, well, for me, it's been five novels and three novellas since I last wrote a monkey book. So it seems, it seems a lifetime ago now. But um, I enjoyed writing the monkey books and people are still enjoying reading them, which is hugely gratifying. But in them, I used a very stripped down of action-packed prose and the embers books gave me chance to kind of open up and become a little more creative um with what i was doing and saying so uh, the language is better i think i leveled up in terms of actual writing with the embers books and i'm, I'm much prouder of them than i am of my books. and then with ragged alice that allowed me to just give full vent to my internal Dylan Thomas and use those rolling Welsh sentences that go on rhythmically for hours and hours and so there were you know, three very different approaches to writing but three but all of them aspects of me and I think if I was looking for my voice voice I think the Embers books are, are what I would consider my real voice rather than the monkey books. And you you are notorious for being basically the nicest man on Twitter, and you spend a lot of your time helping other writers and being a real font of positivity for other people during what are, are often, particularly now, quite tough times. Uh, was that a conscious choice? Yes, it was. Yeah, um, I think this goes back to oh, I can't remember two thousand fifteen, two thousand sixteen certainly in the build up to one of the general elections and then Brexit, Twitter seemed to have become a very toxic place and everyone was arguing and shouting at each other and I, I just was fed up with it. So one night I just uh, sort of tweeted, 
can I help anybody with anything? Um, and I had a huge response uh, from writers. And so I, I keep doing that um, every every so often. If I've got a, an evening free, I'll just say, anyone need any help with anything? And people ask me to come up with character names or to figure out some plot twist they're stuck on or, or, or so, you know, or just how to outline a book or, or whatever. And they just ask the questions because there's a lot of questions as writers it's very hard to find answers to. And I don't give sort of prescriptive advice like you have to do it this way but i just say you know this is this is how i found things and this is you know something that might work for you and people seem to respond very positively to it and i've now built a kind of community around me that for me twitter is a very positive place because everybody's nice to me on there i get very little um very few trolls very few um uh, disagreements or arguments or anything we're mostly just a very positive experience and you're building another different kind of community at the moment so you're you've got a patreon uh with um various supporters helping you um and giving access to you do a i think a monthly um, video blog you provide writing advice kind of little bits of unseen material and things it's it's quite an interesting model, I think, particularly for a writer. Yeah, it's, it's, I struggled at, at the start with what to, you know, I wanted to make it worth people's time. I wasn't sure what to offer, sort of, um, I know artists, friends who've done very well, it's, it's, they, they do it by their paintings, they respond to do this painting, then they share the painting online with, with everybody, and there's kind of a tangible thing. Um, Whereas with writers, it's, you can't really show them the work in progress because your editor won't like that too much. And, you know, because if it's going to be published, so you have to come up with other things. So as I said, writing advice, heads up about incoming stuff and events and so on. And, um, you know, I've just been through all my old files and, and sort of put up short stories that never got published or deleted scenes from previous books and so on um people seem to like it i never think i'm doing enough but um whenever i ask them if they want any more they seem to be quite happy with what i'm doing so it's brilliant for me because although i have that really british thing of not hating to ask for money or, or talk about money it's 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 you know i was raised not to talk about money that it was impolite but this really keeps the wolf from the door for me because um sort of royalty payments and, and you know uh, contracts come at unexpected times and, and you know you can't necessarily count on exactly when you'll get paid for something so to have a month a small monthly income it, i think it just about covers um part of the mortgage and, and you know so that is just one worry less that i have financially so it's um i don't think i could keep writing full time without it to be honest and it feels like a really positive community of people as well it is it is i keep encouraging them all to chat with each other because they are such an interesting group of people um that they really should take advantage and get to network and get to know each other because they are a great great group of people and i think there's over a hundred on there now so it should be um it should be to their advantage to talk to each other it'd be brilliant just to, i love bringing people together so that's uh, and and sometimes people come together you're I, I know you as a very very um willing and compliant kidnap victim yes yeah well if people are kidnapping me to take me to the pub as you were then i'm quite happy with that uh, do you ever get any good fan art I have had some, yes, I've had some brilliant fan art. I've had, um, uh, actually, if I just say this, I can actually show you. So, um, right, oh, here we are. There's some, that's not fan art, that's just, but this is uh, a cover of Fleet of Knives um, made by Ida Silky Fish, um, out of uh, sort of little metal spaceships which is brilliant um, this is by 
and asked if he goes by the name this northern boy. This is a picture of the trouble dog as he sees her. And this from Snowball Art, that's a reflection, is uh, that's Alva Clay from the Envis trilogy. So, uh, and uh, all those artists have done other other fan art as well, which is uh, deeply gratifying. Um, it's always amazing to see something from my brain sort of brought to life through the filter of somebody else's talent. So I'm going to close with what's the, the what is our kind of traditional final SRFC question. So what's coming up next? I've just handed in a new book to Titan, which is not set in the same universe as the Embers uh, books. It's a completely new universe, completely new characters and situation. Um, and I'm writing a, another novel set in that same universe at the moment. I have in March next year the novella I co wrote with Peter F. Hamilton um, called Light Chaser is being published by Tor.com. And what else? And the novel I've just handed into Titan will be out February next year as well. So that's two books I'll have at the beginning of next year. Um, and I've got a couple of other projects bubbling along underneath, but uh, like everyone else, this pandemic has put a bit of a dent in my uh, my ability to, to to work and to concentrate. But that's that's still that's two excellent things to for us all to look forward to. So it's we, we'd love to have you uh, come down to SRC again, perhaps maybe when uh, one of those two two books are out. And so I, I think I will close by saying thank you so much for your time uh, and, and for doing this for us. We are incredibly grateful and, and thank all of you for tuning in. Phil is doing an amazing job pulling all of these videos together and, and giving us a little bit of kind of bookie joy in a, amongst the awfulness that is uh, this kind of COVID-19 world on fire horror show that we've got going on at the moment. So do please, please keep tuning in, um, keep watching, tell your friends, but most of all, stay safe and we will see you on the other side of all of this.